Welcome everyone to the Chip Tide Show Season 2, where it's... everything's pretty much exactly the same. A couple of weeks ago, I made a video about Five Nights at Freddy's, and you all really seem to like it, so today, I'm checking back in for Night 2 at the Pizzeria to talk about some more and Oh, gee! No! 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 Get bad lore! Bad! Whew! For those of you who don't know, I'm not really much of a Five Nights at Freddy's expert. Hell, I'm not even a novice, but it's not because I hate jump scares and am too scared to play any of the games. No, no, I am a novice for... for other... other reasons. Uh, yes, other reasons. What... what are those other reasons? Uh, well, you know, I, it's, it's because I don't like this, okay? But while I may not be qualified to talk about the implications of computer viruses that can take over your brain or whatever the hell this series is about nowadays, I do have a degree in mechanical engineering, and I'm not afraid to use it. Last time, I talked about Fredbear and Spring Bonnie. See, guys, I fixed it. Their names aren't Golden Freddy and Golden Bonnie. I got it. Thank you to all 60 of you who corrected me in the comments. That's right, that's right, I counted. That's not true, actually. I just did control F and found every mention of Fredbear. I don't actually care that much, but I got it. Fredbear and Spring Bonnie. Stupidest name I've ever heard, by the way. Spring Bonnie? What, because it's got spring locks in it? That's like, be like if I were called, I don't know, Carbohydrates Man, but, but I digress. So Golden Bonnie. Last time, I looked into how real life spring locks worked and determined that this scene depicting that evil Winnie the Pooh biting someone's head could not have been the result of a spring lock failure. At least, not from a real life engineering standpoint, there is just no good reason to use a spring lock in the jaw of an animatronic specifically. So, if you're curious to learn about how real life spring locks work, because yes, they are real, a link will be in the end card. Check it out when you're done with this video. However, there was one thing that I overlooked in that video. You see, Brassy Bear and Honey Hair aren't the only two spring lock suits that we see in the games. I wasn't aware of this, but apparently in the fifth game of the franchise, Sister Location, we not only get to see another spring lock suit, but we also get to go inside one. So I picked apart this mini game, figured out exactly how the spring locks are supposed to work, and in the process, I've come to a startling conclusion. William Afton, notorious engineer and serial killer antagonist of the series, is an idiot. Richard, hit that intro. Did you uh did you change the song a little bit for the new intro? That uh that little riff at the end there? I don't don't remember approving that, but uh you know it's fine. It's, we'll make it work. So just as a quick recap, a spring lock is exactly what the name says. It's something that locks a spring in place and keeps it in either a compressed or stretched state. They're usually not all that dangerous or sensitive. I literally just bought one off Amazon and they're mainly used in pens and gate latches. Very spooky stuff. There are a few different styles of spring locks, but in the last video, I showed off a pretty basic design for one. You pull the spring back, you twist the middle parts so of the pin slide into the frame and bada bing, bada boom, you got yourself a lock spring. I had assumed that the spring lock suits in FNAF used a similar style to this, but now looking at the minigame from Sister Location, I'm not so sure. For those of you who are totally chill with jump scares, but haven't played the games yet for completely unrelated but understandable reasons, there's a segment in Sister Location where this creepy clown robot named Baby puts you in a spring lock suit and you gotta survive the night. If you look around while well, in the suit, you'll see these little dials on the side that are slowly unwinding, and you gotta click on them to keep them wound up. If you let one unwind all the way, then the spring locks fail, and you die. Alright, so already a slight problem. You may notice that this spring lock that I have here doesn't have any dials. Sure, you, you can turn the top part to lock it and unlock it, but I mean, once it's locked in place, this thing's not unwinding no matter what you do to it. This thing is solid. All right, so clearly this design is out, but then what the hell is going on here? For a while, I'll admit I was pretty stumped. This 
dial spring lock design isn't a real thing because think about it, springs move linearly. So where would a dial that rotates be useful? Yes, there is such a thing as a coiled spring that could be wound up with a dial, but they're more for spring loading axles and wheels, things that spin. In the case of a spring lock suit, we're trying to pull stuff out of the way, so these wouldn't be of any use. At first, I thought there was no explanation for this outside of just game design. Maybe it was easier to tell at a glance how close each spring was to failing with like a wheel rather than a slider. But the more I thought about it, I realized that there was another real world explanation. One that answers a lot of questions about the spring lock suits and why they fail. And funnily enough, answering questions is not something that William Afton is probably particularly good at because if I'm right, then he's an absolute moron. Let's break it down. Picture, if you will, an elevator brake, or, or one style of elevator brake at least, there's a bunch. I'm sure you all know that an elevator is basically just a box suspended on a cable. The other end of that cable is attached to a big old wheel at the top of the shaft. A motor can turn the wheel to wind up the cable, which pulls the elevator up. When the elevator reaches the desired floor, the motor stops and brake pads clamp down on the wheel, or usually a separate flywheel attached to the same axle. Brake pads are made of some type of rough material like a ceramic with a lot of friction. As long as the force of friction between the pads and the wheel is higher than the force of gravity pulling the elevator down, the elevator will stop. Real elevators also have a ton of fallbacks and safety mechanisms implemented in case the brakes fail. To keep it simple though, we're just gonna stick with this basic system because it'll become pretty clear soon enough that safety wasn't really a priority for Mr. Afton. <laughs> safety mechanisms? More like, more like lengthy mechanisms. Got him. I think that these spring locks in Freddy's work similarly to this. All the motors and supports and stuff that make the animatronic work are attached to the outside of the frame with springs. And through that spring runs a cable which is attached to this dial. Turning the dial winds up the cable which pulls the parts back and compresses the spring. When you want to lock this spring in place, you just apply the brakes. Ignoring the fact that this is by definition, not a spring lock, I think that this explanation matches up surprisingly well with how the spring locks work in the game. Not only is this the only way that these dials make any mechanical sense, it could also explain why they fail so dang much. See, the problem with brake pads is that they can wear over time, slowly becoming less and less effective, so you need to regularly check up on them and replace them when they get too worn down. So if you had a suit that was pretty old, maybe sitting in a warehouse for a while without being inspected, yeah, maybe those brakes aren't quite up to snuff anymore and can't hold those springs as tightly as you like, especially when you jostle it around like you do in the game. It's also heavily implied that the spring locks in the game are hypersensitive to water and moisture. For a real spring lock, this doesn't make any sense. I could literally dunk this thing completely underwater and it would work exactly the same. Heck, there's a higher risk of it rusting shut than snapping open. But if you're using brake pads, then water could reduce the coefficient of friction, making the wheel more likely to slip when you don't want it to. Honestly, this explanation fits way better than I was expecting it to when I started. It explains everything, the dials, the sensitivity, the moisture problem, so much so that I genuinely think this is along the lines of how the game creator envisioned them working and not just me trying to bend over backwards to justify things. There is just one very slight difference that the more astute of you may have noticed between these spring locks and elevators. That's that elevators usually aren't constantly falling. The fact that pretty much every single spring lock we see in the games is hypersensitive means that either the brakes aren't being maintained enough or more likely they were cheap brake pads that weren't strong enough to begin with. When making something like a brake, you want a very large factor of safety. That way if someone, say, 
piles a bunch of heavy boxes or something into your elevator, way more than you were expecting it to have to carry, it's still gonna work. It seems to me like William found the weakest possible brake pads that could still hold the springs back under ideal conditions and called it a day. A lot of you are probably thinking, yeah, actually that makes total sense. William and Fazbear Entertainment were clearly cutting corners to save money. I mean, William is a serial killer for crying out loud. I don't think safety was his number one priority. He's not stupid, he's just callous. Except no, that can't be true because this whole design here isn't cutting any corners. It's adding in like 50 extra corners and flushing thousands, maybe tens of thousands of dollars down the drain for no reason. Brake pads, flywheels, cables, all of that is pretty expensive and each suit seems to have at least six of each of them. You also need some type of mechanism to apply the brakes, be that with brake fluid, electromagnets, whatever it is, that's gonna add even more cost and a ton more bulk. This suit is gonna be heavy. And again, you could have just used real spring locks that you name the suit after, or like I said in the last video, just make the animatronic and the costume two separate things. I guarantee you it'll be the cheapest option in the end. These suits are literally going out of their way to be more complicated and more deadly than they need to be. But again, you're probably saying, yes, that is the point. William Afton is a bad dude. Clearly, he built these suits to be dangerous on purpose in hopes that someone would get killed in it and he wouldn't be blamed for it. And that's all well and good, but stick with me here. If you're secretly building a mascot costume designed to help you get away with murder, maybe don't put your name on the blueprints. Also, you know, if you've designed them to kill the person inside, don't get in it. No matter how you try to justify it, there's no getting around it. William Afton is stupid. Also, I wanted to touch on this real quick to cover my bases. I say that William is the engineer who designed all the suits of Freddy's, but he's actually one of two. There was also his business partner named Henry, who was implied to be the real brains behind the animatronics and notably not a serial killer. Because I guess that's the bar for being good in this franchise. I'm pretty sure it's confirmed that William specifically was the one who made the spring lock suits, but if it was Henry or a joint effort, well then Henry's an idiot too. I don't care what the books say about him being a genius. Anyone who had any part in making these suits was objectively dumb. Unless, of course, Henry knew that William was evil and that he used the spring lock suits to lure kids into the back to kill them, so he purposely built this flaw into the suits to stop William, which is kind of big brain, but also if you think he's a serial killer, just call the cops. So uh, there you have it, the inner workings of the spring lock suits fully explained or at least this specific one from Sister Location. I guess we don't know for sure that they all work in the exact same way, but more importantly, we finally have objective proof that William Afton is not the brilliantly flawed mad scientist that we all thought he was, but rather just an idiot.